Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to warmly thank the organizers of this com timely conference. I'm honored to be here and delighted to meet colleagues I have known for many years, and I appreciate the chance to make new acquaintances. I have listened carefully to all the distinguished speakers and, ha and have learned a great deal from them. I'm tempted to say that there is little else for me to add to what they have so brilliantly presented. Still, I would venture and to share with you some of the insights of my own research. I would say some of my 40 years of research on Muslim-Jewish relations in Morocco. It would perhaps be useful to start this presentation with a definition of history. I hope that the American Sephardi Federation will see no objection if I quote a famous and enlightened Ashkenazi scholar of the Haskalah period, Naftali Zve Wiesel. This thinker wrote in a book he published in Berlin in 1782, Dibre Shalom Ve Emet, that, quote, a knowledge of history helps, helps one toward the love and fear of the Lord. A man becomes wiser out of a knowledge of history. Such knowledge will ennoble his heart and lift him above the thoughts of the mass of uh, daydreaming fools, end quote. La masse des sceaux qui rêve éveillé. Such an early apology of history in, is retrospectively rewarding, especially if you keep in mind the huge challenge posed nowadays to historians by the linguistic turn and postmodernism theories deconstructing history and reducing it to, quote, a fiction making operation, end quote. Eminent historians reacted to these theories and put forward strong arguments in favor of their discipline. Eric Hobsbawm was one of them. In earlier times, too, historians had to confront similar challenges. Nietzsche, yes, Nietzsche himself, was one of their most ardent critics. As you certainly guess, the reference made here to an Ashkenazi thinker and to the Ashkenazi world is not a mere coincidence. Part of my approach to history and inclination to comparative history is due to my early readings while still in high school of Anne Frank Diary and the literature devoted to European Jews. Such readings raised interrogation about etymology and the significance of terms and concepts such as antisemitism, Jewish question, Judenfrage, ghetto, shtetl, Judenviertel, pogrom, Nazism, Shoah, and so forth. Now I move to the topic of Jewish Muslim relations in the Moroccan context. Needless to say that historically speaking, these relations went through ups and downs. Several factors explain the downs I have just mentioned, namely the total dependence of the country on highly uncertain climatic conditions, the level of its agriculture and handicraft technical resources, the limited means, uh, excuse me, the devastating effects of periodical famine and epidemics, interranium difficulties, the limited means of the state, Mahzen, tribal uprising, messianic movements, armed confrontation with European invaders, etc. However, these turbulences did not affect the foundation of Muslim Jewish relations. In French, I would say, rather than foundation, soccer. This foundation remained basically unshaken, at least until the contemporary era. The explanation of this resilience could be looked for in several centuries of cohabitation, all sorts of interactions between Muslims and Jews, and various form of, forms of solidarity. Such facts help understand the permanence of Judaism in today's Morocco, as well as the ties kept by the Jews of Moroccan origin with their country. The process of Quote, Judaization of the Berbers and Berberization of the Jews, and quote, emphasized by Haim Hirscherberg, is highly significant in this respect. Living within the limits of the same territory, obeying the same sultans, sharing the same dialects, languages, and culture, represented strong cumulative factors of cohesion. 
commenting on the Moroccan feelings toward Europeans, usually perceived as potential crusaders, French, British, and other ambassadors to Morocco used to state in their reports that, quote, the Hebraic fanaticism was as inflexible as the Mohammedan fanaticism, end quote. A few features of pre-colonial Morocco could bring some additional insight. A report sent to the Foreign Office in July 1893 by the British ambassador to Tangier, in Tangier, West Ridgeway, provides an overview of the general condition of the Jews during the last decade of the 19th century. Quote, the Jews of Morocco number about 300,000, but many are in the mountain district absorbed in the general population with whom they fare equally well. On the whole, the treatment of the Jew is better than that of the Muslim. Most of the rich Jews, Jews enjoy foreign protection, and even the poor Jew, who is still a Moroccan subject, is exempt from taxation and military service." End quote. Now, what are the main aspects or features reflecting the traditional proximity or relative proximity between Muslims and Jews in Morocco? I'll, men I'll mention, dans le désordre, some of these aspects. Number one, economic complementarity. Agriculture was the main activity of the Muslim, whereas the Jews held a large place in handicraft, commerce, and peddling. The Jews were involved in agricultural uh, activities through partnerships with Muslim peasants, the Jewish merchants, Merchant elite enjoyed a predominant position in the maritime trade. The most dynamic element of this elite acted as Tujar Sultan, uh, let's say, uh, king's mer merchants. They enjoyed all sorts of privileges and held what we call Dahir Tawqir Wahtiram, namely royal decrees of respect and safeguard. Anyway, uh, these merchants were known as being, quote, kind in private life, cruel in business, end quote. Anyway, their historical role as vectors of modernity could be linked to their relative familiarity with Western Europe. Some of them have tried as early as the 16th century to import printing machines. We can imagine the potential consequences of such, of such a revolution. Among these court Jews, Abraham Maimoran deserves special mention. He acted as the banker of Sultan Moulay Ismail. A Dutch consul in Morocco compared him to the powerful minister of Louis XIV, Colbert. You imagine? <laughs> Maimoran had in charge the negotiations with European ambassadors and missionaries trying to redeem Christian captives. captives. All of them saw him as their bête noire. Other Jewish merchants were also active in selling the goods captured on, on board of European vessels by Muslim corsairs from Tetouan, Saleh, Rabat, uh, corsairs of Andalusian and Morisco origin, uh, ascent. The Italian duty por uh, free port, Livorno, was the first market place where they used to sell their, these goods. Some of the Jews who settled in Livorno for a while migrated later to Holland and to England. In Great Britain, they were known as Berberiscos. They considered themselves as Sephardim. This was the case of Moses Montefiore's family. The visit that Montefiore undertook to Marrakesh in 1863-1864 had a tremendous impact on Moroccan Jewish communities and their relations with the Muslims. Number two, popular religiosity. Muslims and Jews had in common the veneration of saints, male as well as female. Some of them venera were venerated by the two groups. All of them shared the belief in the exceptional supernatural power and charisma of the saints, Baraka. Their intercession, I mean the saints inter uh, intercession was collectively acted, asked for during periods of drought. In such circumstances, Jews and Muslims used to pray to fast and to perform processions. Such rituals were and remain a symbolic aspect of the symbiosis which existed up to a certain extent between Muslims and Jews. This symbiosis was also manifest during the last day of Passover. 
as part of the celebration of the Mimuna, urban Jews used to go with their families to the nearby countryside to enjoy themselves. Harvey Goldberg wrote in this respect that, quote, Muslims used to welcome them into their gardens or onto their lands and saw their coming as a sign of a year of rain, end quote. This is someone somehow fantastic, Muslims believing in the baraka of the Jews. Nowadays, the Mimuna Convivencia is still in force in Morocco, though at a limited scale. It has taken a huge dimension in Western Europe and Canada. Moroccan Jews and Muslims, including kids and youngsters, used to gather to listen to Andalusian music, have meals, kosher, I guess, uh, in a friendly, congenial, and highly noisy ambiance. I witnessed that live in Amsterdam. You know uh, the dimension that the uh, Marokaim, I say just Marokaim, had given to Mimuna in Israel. Number three, education. Education methods were similar in both communities. Basically, the Jewish Slav, where children, except young girls, used to gather around an old monster, did not differ from the Quranic schools. Physical punishment, punishments were, in both cases, considered as efficient means of teaching, namely making the kids memorize the Torah or the Quran. Nowadays, a dynamic school and a high school known as Groupe Scolaire Maimonide in Casablanca, operates in Casablanca with Jewish and Muslim pupils. Seeing these pupils together in the same classes is deeply moving and promising. Number four, a word about the Melas. In 1721, a British visitor, John Windus, described the Melah of Meknes as follows, quote, in the middle of the city live the Jews, having a place for themselves, the gates of which are locked at night. They have an qaid and al-qaid to guard their gates and protect them against the common people." End quote. More than a century later, a French writer, Pierre Loti, visited this melah. He was impressed by the hispano moresque luxury and pure Arabic fine taste he witnessed in the house of an opulent merchant, Yaqub Ohenna. He compared Ohenna to some elegant vizier, quote unquote, enjoying the delights of 1,001 nights in his finely designed and richly furnished house, end quote. In peaceful times, Jews could move in and out freely. Muslims used to come to the Melah to sell vegetables and fruits, buy Jewish-made commodities, and enjoy mahya drinking. In one instance, a sultan took advantage of this drinking and other mixing habits as a pretext for stigmatizing his disobedient Muslim subjects in, in Rabat. He accused them of celebrating the Shabbat with their Jewish neighbors. Even in a holy city such as Fez, depicted by Europeans as a result of Mahometan fanaticism, Jewish merchants and craftsmen had stores and shops in the Medina. Moreover, some of them used to rent in this part of the city, at low prices, buildings belonging to the state or even to Muslim endowment, Habus. Under the protectorate regime, the Resident General put, tried to put an end to this situ situation. In the Melah of Fez, a city where a medieval uh, warehouse and a sort of hostel known as Fandak Lihudi existed in the Medina. In the Melah of Fez, Two synagogues have been recently restored. The first one, Danan Synagogue, has retained after its renovation in the late 1990s the attention of UNESCO. During the inauguration ceremony in uh, 2013 of the second one, known as Slat al Fasiyin, King Mohammed VI insisted in his message on the bimillennial Jewish presence in Morocco and on the importance of the Jewish dimension of the country's history, culture, and patrimonial legacy. Number five, the era of change. At this stage, I would like to say a few words about the process of deep and irreversible changes that started in mid-19th century. This process was amplified, amplified, amplified in the 20th century in the larger context of international events developments and events. 
In the 19th century, these changes arose in connection with the forced integration of Morocco into the world market. The so-called opening Morocco to civilization imposed by the European powers meant all sorts of structural socioeconomic transformation among transformations among the Jewish communities and their Muslim environment. During the same period, military confrontation with France and Spain had all sorts of, sorts of consequences. The Jews of Tetouan, for instance, suffered a lot just before and after the fall of their city and the Spanish occupation. The Franciscan missionaries tried to convert some of them. Elsewhere, especially in Sawira, Protestants used charity as a means to convert poor Jews. The Jewish dignitaries asked British ambassador to expel these missionaries. They threatened to call the chief of nearby, tribe, nearby tribes at the rescue. It was during this period that European and American Jewish associations such as the Anglo-Jewish Association, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, and the Union of American Hebrew Congregations started paying a great deal of attention to the Moroccan Jewish communities. They began providing assistance to them during periods of drought. Among the other factors of change that had tremendous impact, particular insistence should be made upon a sort of throwing horse, a cheval de Troyes, used by all the European powers as part of their so-called peaceful penetration, namely the systematic use of capitulary rights. The system uh, had devastating effects on the Moroccan state and it, on its sovereignty over an increasing number of the sultan's subjects, especially the upper classes, Jews as well as Muslims. Such individuals, known as the protégé, al himayat and holder of passports, of foreign passport, uh, al passport, enjoyed extraterritorial privileges and tax exemptions. The failure of the reforms and modernization attempts undertaken by the sultans was largely due to this situation and to the collapse of the treasury income. Within this context, influential Jews provided assistance to some of their Muslim friends and partners. This assistance has sometime, had sometimes a sort of ritual dimension. Sultan Muley Hassan tried to tackle foreign protection, the foreign protection issue. An international conference held in Madrid in 1880 was held, it was held at his, at his request in Madrid in 1880. This conference had, however, op opposite results except one, the mention in the Convention of Madrid of the principle stating that the allegiance of the Moroccan subjects to their sultans was perpetual. This principle was reaffirmed in the 1958 Moroccan Nationality Code. An episode I have witnessed more than 10 years ago in Fez is significant in this respect. Some 20 Jews living in France, Israel, and elsewhere came to visit Fez and Meknes. During the reception given in their honor, the mayor of Fez said to them in his speech, quote, ladies and gentlemen, I wonder whether I should venture to welcome you. I'm aware that you were here before us. This country is yours." End quote. The failure of the reform attempts undertaken by the Sultan, Sultans paved the way to the French protectorate, especially after the conclusion of the Entente Cordiale in 1904. An international Crisis followed the visit of the German emperor to Tangier in 1905. The representative of the American president Theodore Roosevelt acted de facto as mediator at the Algeria Conference 1906 held in order to avoid a general confrontation, conflagration in Europe. Foreign Jewish Association asked Roosevelt to include religious freedom in Morocco on the agenda of the conference. Moroccan Jewish notabilities did not endorse this initiative laid basically by the banker and philanthropist Jacob Hirsch Schiff. In a letter to, Roose to President Roosevelt, the Grand Rabbi of Tangier, Mordechai Benjou, wrote, 
Quote, apparently the American government is under the impression that the Moroccan Jews are badly treated and oppressed. This is not the case at all. In justice to the Moroccan government, I declare that the Jews of Morocco are well treated and that we have absolutely no reason of complaint. End quote. As regards the colonial era, I limit myself to the speech made by a Moroccan Jew established in New York, Haim Toledano, addressing in 1913 the annual meeting of the Alliance Israelite Universelle Alumni Association gathered in Tangier, Toledano said with a remarkable perspicacity, quote, the new era that begins now for Morocco is pregnant of a new life. The traditional role of the Jews is destroyed in these circumstances, except those who had built positions able to challenge any assault, native Israeli masses will soon feel the economic pressure of the new regime, end quote. Despite the stability and security brought by the protectorate regime, broadly speaking, Toledano for, Toledano's forecast did not remain hypothetical. The Jewish masses, especially the artisans, small shopkeepers, and peddlers went, went indeed through hard times. The deterioration of their daily conditions were due in part to the impoverishment of their main customers, namely the Muslim masses, essentially the peasants. The Jewish elites were disappointed too. They felt that France has deceived them. The attempts made in order to enforce Vichy laws in the protectorate traumatized most of them. Sultan Sidi Mohammed bin Yusuf opposed, opposed the systematic implementations of these laws. The protection granted to his Jewish subject remains part of their collective memory. Nowadays, he is considered de facto as a writer among the nations. Of high significance in this respect is, the, is in this respect the ceremony which took place here in New York in December 2015. It was in a Sephardi synagogue that Princess Lala Hasna received the Martin Luther King and uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel the uh, Liber Liberty Award granted to her father in recognition of his attitude during World War II. During the same period, Muslim masses depicted by French fascist activists as our Arab brothers, no frères Arab, did not listen to the inflammatory appeals pushing them to plunder the Jews. Thousands of other Muslim particip Muslims, particip Moroccan Muslims participated in the Allied war effort against the Third Reich. The citation signed by the American Chief of Staff, General Marshall, yes, General Marshall himself, stipulated that, quote, the second battalion of the 8th Moroccan Regiment is cited for outstanding performance of duty in action against the enemy despite heavy losses and the formidable enemy resistance, end quote. Nowadays, many elderly Muslims still perceive the massive, massive emigration of their Jewish neighbors as a sort of trauma and amputation. To sum up, let's say that everything went too fast in the aftermath of Second World War, especially between 1947 and 1967, uh, 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 largely in connection with the Middle East dramatic events. The author of La Mémoire Brisée des Juifs Marocains, a former journalist at Radio Shalom in Paris, Victor Malka, has contributed in 2018 to a special issue of the CRIF, the Consistoire Représentatif des Israélites de France, in, a bil uh, in the bil a bulletin of this uh, association, partly devoted, this, his article was partly, devo uh, this issue, special issue, issue was partly devoted to past and present Moroccan Judaism. His article, I mean Vic, uh, Malka's article, is entitled L'Exception Marocaine. The multi-dimension ties of Moroccan Jews or Jews of Moroccan origin with Morocco represent one of the main components of this exception. Beside the preservation of the Moroccan part of their cultural identity, very important in, is in this respect, 
are their visit to Fez, Marrakesh, Casablanca, and their participation in Hirot. No less important was and remained their mobilization around the Sahara issue. In his book, Essay d'Histoire et de Civilisation Judéo-Marocaine, Simon Levy, the co-founder of the Casablanca Musée du Judaïsme Marocain, gave all sorts of indications about this mobilization. In present-day Morocco, of high significance were, are also the following facts. The, constitution, the new constitution of the kingdom, King Mohammed VI's message issued two years later on the, on the occasion of the inauguration of in phase of the uh, resta uh, restored synagogue, Slat Fessiyin, the king's decision to give back to the ancient Jewish quarter of Marrakesh his, its former name, Malah, and the sovereign decision to erect in Fez a museum specially dedicated to Jewish memory. These initiatives and achievements represent a powerful incentive to the growing awareness of Moroccan Muslims vis-a-vis -vis the importance of the Jewish heritage of their country, as well as the need of safeguarding and promoting this rich legacy. I strongly believe that models of broadly peaceful, if not harmonious, relations between men and women of different religions or with no religion could convey exemplarity and be helpful in the common struggle against racism, extremism, populism, dogmatism, and violence. Goodwill is obviously not enough. However, it paves the way to hope and dialogue. Scholars and intellectuals share a great deal of responsibility in this respect. A recent and meaningful event is the tribute paid last week by the Academy of the Kingdom of Morocco to Professor Haim Zafrani, which I had the pleasure and privilege to coordinate. Ha Haim and Celia Zafrani were my family's friend. Eminent American professor participated in the conference dedicated to Haim Zafrani. Uh, for instance, Abraham Udovich of Princeton University, Dale Eckelman, Dartmouth College, Emily Gottrich, Berkeley University, Jessica Marjlin, etc. Some other participants are here in this uh, amphitheater. <laughs> To conclude, let me share with you what a renowned French historian, Jean-Pierre Rioux, wrote as regards his discipline. Quote, history is understanding, not complicity. History is a science which enlightens self-conscience, other conscience, and the world conscience. History means intelligence, not certainties, end quote. Let me add, à bon entendeur, salut. Salam, shalom. So now very briefly, some of the pictures you have already seen <laughs> due to technical coordination. <laughs> problems. Fantastic. <laughs> this is a decree of respect and, and safeguard granted by Sultan Muley Abdelaziz to a rabbi in the countryside. You recognize the Jews with the kippah and the Muslim with his turban. Jews in the market. Ethnically speaking, can you distinguish between the Jews and the Muslims? Here, a procession. It was a year of drought in the beginning of the 1920s, a procession in Isawira, praying God. A Jewish sla I mentioned in my uh, presentation. in a seat. La, la noce juive, uh, Eugène de la Croix.
بريتيش انفلونس اني صويرة موكادور ا فاميلي هيلثي ان اوبيلنت فاميلي اوف تنجير the wealth uh, some of them went to uh, immigrated to uh, brazil amazonia latex extraction street of fez with Muslims, Jews there, over there, and Europeans. This is a result of Mahometan fanaticism. This is my uh, best. I have uh, just relaxing in the Melah. Here also, the Jews with the kippah and the Muslim with his turban. The excellent work of the Alliance Israelite Universelle as regards uh, education, modern education. Uh, basketball team. This is a, the message of the President Roosevelt. Uh, November uh, 1924, just before the landing of the American troops on the Moroccan shores. In French, it's signed by General Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower in Arabic. And this is something funny in this message. The president is asking the Moroccan to welcome the American Mujahideen. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Casablanca. Uh, Sultan Sidi Mohammed bin Yusuf, beside President Roosevelt, and I should say that uh, Winston Churchill was not happy with this, the presence of the Sultan in this, uh, beside the, the American uh, president. This is also <laughs> fantastic, a Moroccan soldier dragging the flag of the uh, Third Reich. This is the uh, citation I referred to of uh, General Marshall, paying tribute to the courage of Moroccan troops. Uh, Moroccan troops parading in the Champs Elysees in, uh, I think, June 1945. Uh, Sidi Mohammed bin Youssef with uh, dignitaries from Meknes, just before his exile to Madagascar. This is uh, Crown Prince Moulay Hassan paying visit to a synagogue on the occasion of Yom Kippur in 1959. Same visit to a Casablanca synagogue on Yom Kippur. Jews, Jewish citizens taking uh, part uh, to the first elections in Morocco in 1960. You have Jewish women, Jewish men, and here, Muslim women with the traditional veil. Hassan II with uh, Shimon, uh, Isaac Rabin and uh, Shimon Peres after the signature of the Oslo Agreement here in Washington. They stopped Casablanca to thank Hassan II for the role, his role in the peaceful in the peace process that led to Oslo. Same. This is a ceremony in the so-called Rambam, Rabbi Moshi Ibn Maimoun, 
center in Paris. Uh, Ambassador uh, Mohamed Barada, and I don't know whether you recognize the second uh, man with <laughs> guess. This is the ceremony I referred to in New York in December uh, 2015. Same. And uh, Ambassador Omar Hilal was, was, uh, was here uh, yesterday. Andrea Azoulay in Sawira, opening festival. Haim and Celia Zafrani. Here, same Zafrani with uh, friends. And I, I have mentioned Ohanna in uh, what I said about Meknes. This is Rene Ohanna, one of the members of this uh, family. Simon Levy, I refer to. Muslim and Jews, youngsters hoisting the Moroccan flag in the same museum, Musée du Judaïsme Marocain. Synagogue in Casablanca. And here, King Mohammed VI awarding a Grand Rabbi, the Grand Rabbi Misses. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>